Hi, my name is Nate Hagens. Um, we're going to have about a four to five hour video series about humans and the future, explaining the human predicament. It's not something we think about much, but our species has taken 10,000 years in the Neolithic Revolution through the Industrial Revolution to get to this point. Uh, we have doubled our entire energy and size of our economies in the last 30 years versus everything that came before. You are 19 or 20, so in your lifetime, by the time you're 70 or 80, according to expectations, we will double again, not once, but twice. What are the implications of that if the size of the human endeavor quadruples in your lifetime? What are the impacts on the environment? What are the impacts on equality? What are the impacts on our cities and our land? Uh, what are the variables that go into this happening or not? Would it be a good thing? Would it be a bad thing? What happens if it doesn't happen? So in order to understand those things, we're going to have to look at human behavior. We're going to have to look at ecology, environment, energy, money, systems, how everything fits together. And a lot of people are experts in psychology or engineering or anthropology but we often don't hear the whole story, how everything fits together, and that's gonna be the attempt that we do in this video. Okay, before we get to the video series, let me give you a quick uh, intro of who I am. Um, I worked on Wall Street. I managed money for billionaires. Um, that was about the time that you guys were born. And I started to realize that the prices of things we buy don't include the impacts on the environment. I started to realize that the main input into our economic system is fossil carbon in the form of coal, oil, and natural gas, and that that wasn't uh, totally available forever. It was probably going to start to decline in my lifetime. So I quit my Wall Street job and I started to research these things full time, human behavior, energy, economy. And this video series is kind of the culmination of 15 years of my research uh, with experts in these areas. So this video series is going to give us a picture of how everything fits together. It's not going to provide answers, but it will provide a context for what it means to be alive at this amazing and perilous time, and maybe suggestions on what to do in your own life uh, and what to do to play a role in society's future. So let's get started with the first series of videos before we understand what to do and about energy and the economy we have to look at the beating heart of the issues that we face today and that is the human being ourselves let's take a look at where we came from how we got here what drives us what opportunities and constraints there are with our brains and our behavior this first video lays out the logic of evolution and our behaviors not so much what we do but why we do things the Big Bang was about 14 billion years ago, forming the materials and energetic basis for future life. There's been life on our planet for about 4 billion years. Insects were 600 million years, mammals roughly 100 million, hominids around 6 million, humans around 300,000 years. Humans are at the end of one branch on the tree of life. There are approximately 10 million other species we share the planet with, possibly many more. Humans share DNA ancestry with every one of these living organisms on our planet. We share almost 99% with our close cousins, the chimpanzees and bonobos, some 90% of our DNA with cows, 80% with cats, 70% with mice, 60% with fruit flies, and even 50% of our DNA is the same as found in a banana. It is a profound truism that we share a common ancestry and a current Earth environment with a fantastically large array of other living things. There is a common belief we are separate from animals, above them. We tend to think of humans as special. We are certainly unique, but in the same way that beetles or tree frogs are unique. It's understandable that this story makes us feel good, but it isn't true. What makes us unique is of particular relevance to our current planetary and cultural dilemmas and is going to be the main topic of this video series. 
Okay, back to biology. As college students, you're all likely have a general idea about what natural selection is and how it works. But just for a very quick review, here's the general concept. Each species has variation that can be inherited. There's competition within each species for many things like food, water, survival, reproductive success due to overreproduction. Certain traits will make certain organisms in a species more fit, aka more likely to survive and pass on their genes. Over time, these organisms with higher relative fitness will have higher genetic success, aka more babies, and the beneficial trait will then become more predominant in a population. This is also known as survival of the fittest and is one of the primary mechanisms that drives evolution. Without knowing what species it is or anything at all about it, we can infer some things about an animal's behavior by its physical characteristics. Imagine you were an alien anthropologist beaming skeletons, samples, fossils, and creatures aboard your ship, trying to puzzle out what the species was like, what sort of social structure, foraging behavior, living conditions. What could you infer just from the remains of skeletons of Earth's species? Well, quite a lot, actually. What sort of creature would look like this? We can infer that those dots looking like a face were useful for avoiding predation, to look like a larger creature instead of a defenseless moth. And so those dots were adaptive. And what about this creature? We could infer it lives in an environment where food is up high. And this one? This is a bit trickier. The leading hypothesis is that the stripes make the zebra seem like a collection of smaller animals and thus more difficult prey to the tsetse fly, making it confused and leaving the zebras alone, and thus being an adaptive trait. Here's an example a bit closer to us, one of the seven other great ape species. Here's a male and female skeleton of a mountain gorilla. What might an alien anthropologist infer about their behavior? Well, this species has sexual dimorphism, where the males are significantly larger than the females. This is called a tournament species. In contrast to a pair bonding species, tournament species are where one or a few males end up having mating access to all or most of the females meaning most males don't pass on their genes at all, meaning selection pressure continues to favor stronger and bigger males. And what about this creature, who happens to be my student and summer intern? What can an alien anthropologist infer about this one? Well, it could point out a few obvious characteristics. First, this creature has a relatively small mouth. There are many possible explanations for this. We cook our food, which requires a smaller mouth than eating it raw. However, the main reason for the small mouth of humans is their super sociality. Humans don't need to fight for food, they tend to share it. So they don't need to eat fast as non-social animals do. This species walks on two legs, what's up with that? Well, this is bipedalism. Hominids needed to walk upright to free up their hands for other tasks and also be able to run to chase prey. Other than his super long skull hair, this creature has very little other hair. What's up with that? Well, practically all mammals smaller than a hippo have fur. Humans are, were, endurance hunters who succeed by tiring their prey, sometimes literally chasing it to death. This is possible because they sweat, so they can endure prolonged effort that would simply kill most other animals. Not having hair is an adaptation that helped us be endurance runners. How about those whites around the eyes? The whites around the eyes are called sclera. Out of 92 primate species, including humans, 85 of them have exposed sclera that are uniformly brown or dark brown. So why did the human sclera become so large and visible? The main explanation is that humans signal to other members of their species where they're looking, where they're directing their attention. This is part of the general tendency of humans of communicating with each other by sending all sorts of visual signals. Okay, so what if we consider what can't be seen in fossils or skeletons? The brain. Because just as much as our jaws or our legs or our eyes or our kidneys are products of what worked in the past, so too is this evolved organ. What sort of psychological adaptations could you predict from the anthropological evidence we lived in small bands of hunter-gatherers on the plains of Africa for tens of thousands of generations? Well, let's think about the brain. As we evolved, what was to become the neocortex developed on top of and in complex synergy with the older brain structures of the limbic system and the primitive reptilian core. 
Thus, in a very real way, we each have an inner worm, an inner fish, an inner insectophore, upon which are overlaid structures relevant to more recent environments like our tribal savanna existence. It might be helpful to visualize our neocortex that can solve math problems and learn Spanish as a mahout riding atop an elephant. The elephant is our more primitive neural system. The takeaway here, the regions of our brain that have the longest history related to fight or flight, fear and lust, reward and failure, are much more powerful than our newer logical and science interested areas of the brain. This is why we worry more about snakes than car crashes, about being unpopular rather than nuclear war, and about acquiring stuff rather than preserving a healthy environment, which is why we'll watch a Despacito video 5 billion times, but something important to our futures will watch 20 seconds and turn it off. Most humans are mostly elephant most of the time, but we don't have to be. The environment for most organisms is very similar to that of their ancestors. So the behaviors they do today, wake up and go chase a gazelle, is similar to what they've always done. But not so humans. Our situation today is radically different than our past. The modern human brain is an evolved organ in a Stone Age context. We execute adaptations that worked well for our ancestors in novel environments today. Back to biology. We don't go through our days trying to maximize fitness. Once we're born, we try to replicate the same emotional mental state of our successful ancestors. Once organisms, including humans, are born, they become adaptation executors, not fitness pursuers. So our deep feelings direct us to do things that give us the same neurotransmitters that helped our ancestors be more fit in their day, even when those adaptations make no rational sense in the present or future. The brain of a stock trader making a winning trade lights up in the same way that a chimpanzee and orangutan under an MRI machine does when they find a nut or a berry. In the same way we don't like to be hot or cold, but instead at a temperature just right, our brain modules steer us towards being well-liked, entertained, well-fed, taken care of, supportive of our tribe, fearful of outgroups, dismissive of abstract threats, etc., in each of our daily routines, when we do things that feel right, without much deliberation or self-awareness, we're generally following what we could refer to as the agenda of the gene. It's not a real agenda, but the default tendencies we inherited from our successful ancestors. The agenda of the gene is neither admirable nor useful. It just exists in our minds as nominal hardware settings. It also represents a steep hill that has to be scaled in order to pursue any rational goals. We are walking forward, but our brains are still looking backward. The agenda of the gene. Wait, I thought my mind was shaped all by nurture, culture, education, my parents, my friends, my favorite shows, etc. You're telling me nature has something to do with how I think? Yes, we are born not as a blank slate, but with prepared learning. Does sex feel good? Do you find babies cute? Do you care what people think about you? Do cheesy nachos taste really awesome? Of course nature has something to do with all this. And as we're going to see in this video series, it has a big bearing on our current predicament in some incredibly important ways. It's now becoming pretty clear that fitness for decent human futures now requires that some adaptations not be executed. It is possible to pursue better futures because minds that can look forward with an understanding and an ethic, things which will forever be denied the process of evolution, have great potential. The rest of this video series is going to look at a great many ways our brains can be hijacked by modern human culture, and therein offers both the core challenges and where some paths of hope reside. So, quick summary. Evolution is a thing. Our modern skulls house a Stone Age mind. Some things that have deeper brain connections shout louder than others. As this video series progresses, I challenge you to think about how you think. This is called metacognition. Notice when something feels good. It likely feels that way because it helped your ancestors survive. Think about whenever you feel bad. What just happened? It was likely adverse to your ancestors' fitness. It's hard to overstate the importance of this topic because it's our mind. It's our brain. It's how we experience the world. 
and understanding where it comes from and why we feel the way we feel can offer invaluable insights into who we are as human beings and how we interact with the world. Now, let's talk about sex.